Did you know that billions upon billions of footprints are preserved in the rock record? Well, bones get all the attention, right? Fossil footprints, which is a type of ichnofossil, they may just outnumber bones. How can we make sense of this observation? I mean, surely preserving a bone has to be a whole lot easier than preserving a footprint, right? Well, today I'm starting a series called Flood Geology Failures, and I'm going to highlight fossil footprints as our first example of the utter failure of flood geology. Now, flood geology is the name given to the explanatory framework that young earth creationists have come up with to explain the world's geological column, all the rock record and the present day topology of the earth. Does it make sense to try to explain all the geological column in the context of a global flood not too many thousand years ago? I don't think so, but I want to provide a, some specific examples of where this ge flood geology explanation for the geological column is a complete and utter failure in my mind. So to kick us off, I want to start by taking a closer look at fossil footprints and ask the following questions. Should we expect to find billions of fossil footprints in the fossil record? Is that an expectation? Is that something we should expect to find or are we surprised to find that? Secondly, does conventional geology or flood geology, which is young earth creationism, provide a better framework for understanding the footprint formations and distributions of footprints that we observe in the fossil record. So we're gonna have to talk a little bit about just how many fossil footprints there are, where we find them, what context do we find them, in order to be able to answer a couple of these questions. So I'm gonna call this first part of the series a fossil paradox. Footprints are rarely preserved in stone, and yet they're very common. We've got that coming up next. All right, to kick us off, we're gonna take a trip to Death Valley National Park. A couple years back, I took my father uh, out on a trip out west and we, we spent a good day in uh, Death Valley National Park. And it's just one of, it's a really awesome place to visit. And so I took two of my sons back there as well when we did a, a Western visit, uh, did the Grand Canyon, but also got over to Death Valley National Park. And it was on that trip that I took this particular picture. It was early spring. We did it over spring break, and this is early April. And here we have an ephemeral pond below sea level uh, that is eventually going to dry up in the not too distant future. It was some 95 degrees the day we were there already. And so it's quickly disappearing and drying. And here we are on the salt flats uh, near that same uh, ephemeral lake. And you can see that we're walking around and we're making a lot of footprints in this salt encrusted soil. Now, all those footprints we left behind. Do you think any of them are there today? <laughs> no, I, it's very doubtful, right? That any of them have survived, right? We were there. We existed at a point in time in the past and we left our mark there, but our mark is now gone, right? The evidence that we were there no longer exists and we're not going to be able to recreate it. We're not leaving uh, something behind that somebody in the future will be able to identify we were there. That's the great thing about fossil footprints is when you do find a fossil footprint, a, a footprint encased in the stone, right? It represents a moment in time when an individual organism placed their foot at that particular location. And that's why it's so interesting, I think, to walk in fossil footprints is because you're walking in the place of where, let's say, a dinosaur walked. And it's one thing to find a dinosaur bone, right, which represents like there's the organism, but maybe it was dead and that bone got dragged to that particular location. But when you walk in the footprint, right, as was shown in the first picture uh, in my introduction, that footprint represents that particular layer of sediment that is now rock, right, was existed at some point in the past and some organism placed its foot there and made that impression. And so it's a very powerful thing. I think, I think even my kids recognize when we visited several uh, dinosaur footprint sites, the, 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 it's a palpable feeling of like a past organism's presence and you're, you're like there with them at that time. But let's get back to talking about what is the chance that any footprint that gets left will be preserved for 100 years, 5 years, 
15 minutes, all right? Five million years into the future. Now, in my recent trip with my father, we got up very early one morning before sunrise, drove down into the basin of Death Valley. We're below sea level, and we're walking among the dunes waiting for the sun to rise, right? Really epic experience in terms of the sunrise there. Um, and as we're walking amongst these dunes, my father noticed several boot prints that are in the hardened ground, like of the sand. And recently, winds had blown a sand dune away, leaving this hardscaped ground left. And here's this boot print. You know, although we weren't present, right, when these prints were created, I don't think it's unreasonable to infer that these were made by a shoe, much like the one I am wearing, right, in this picture. And probably when the soil is wet, because I'm walking around on the same hardened ground and I'm not leaving really any tracks at all. But when was that boot print created? Days, weeks, months, maybe years ago? It hadn't rained there in a couple weeks. So I was pretty sure they were at least a couple weeks old. And even if it rained, this ground was very hard. The prints could well have survived for multiple small rain events. So maybe it's months. Furthermore, there are small sand dunes in this area that are always being moved around by the wind. These prints were probably covered in a sand dune just a few yards away not too long ago, right? I'm, I've, I've, I've circled where the boot prints are, and the boot prints go right up to that sand dune and likely go underneath that sand dune. And so that sand dune has been you know, traversing across this uh, hardened mud landscape. So it's possible the footprints had been covered by the dune for maybe months, possibly years, and only recently exposed. So regardless of their exact age, the point is that the footprints can be preserved over long periods of time. The bottom of Death Valley is doing what? It's accumulating sand and sediments from the surrounding mountains. Uh, there's surely preserved footprints of Native Americans, tourists who have visited this region for thousands of years, lying right under the layers of sand and other sediments. Right? The, even these boot prints on, are on a particular layer of mud sediment that is sitting on top of previous layers that might have been exposed 10 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, and somebody may have walked on those and then been covered up and they are still present there. Sand may be blown over a set of hardened tracks or a large flash flood might bring a layer of mud and stone and lay it right on top of this trackway sometime in the near future. Over time, these preserved tracks will become more deeply buried and eventually the sediments in those layers will become cemented together to form sandstones and conglomerates. In the future, if this region, if this whole region is uplifted and that rock begins to erode then, the footprints will eventually appear at the surface just as we observe millions of footprints in other locations preserved in rocks today. Let's think about footprints for a moment. And I'll say to make this general statement, very rare events don't mean that the outcomes of those very rare events are uncommon. Ow, Joel, what the heck are you talking about? Doesn't that sound a little bit weird? How can be something be so common and yet be exceedingly rare? When we're talking about footprints, preserved footprints in particular, both can be true because we're talking about two different things. The chances of any single footprint made by a person and, pres and preserved for thousands or millions of years of course, that's vanishingly small. Think about all the footprints that you have made during your lifetime. The number of times you've stepped in something and left a footprint behind. How many of those, of those do you think still exist today? Years later, months later, weeks later, days later. There's a good chance that really none of them are still present. However, so we're saying it's, it's a super small chance, right? But even if only one out of every trillion footprints made is eventually preserved. Preserved footprints should actually be very common. And you know what? They are. We have millions and billions and actually billions times billions of fossil footprints in the fossil record. I think of it another way. We could ask ourselves this question. What is the chance that no footprints would ever be preserved? When you think of it that way, you think, well, no, of course there's going to be some footprints preserved. Why? Because quintillions upon quintillions upon quintillions of footprints are being created all the time. 
To believe that no footprints will be preserved is to suggest that, that out of all those quintillions of opportunities, none of them actually survive. Think of it as like the lottery. What are the chances that an individual, right, like an individual footprint, but an individual wins the lottery? Extremely small. But what are the chances that somebody, that someone is going to win the lottery? Even though the chances of one individual being very, very small, such that you would never place a bet on that particular person winning the lottery. But the overall chances that somebody wins, of course, is very high. You've probably created hundreds of thousands of footprints in the sand and mud during your lifetime. The chances that even one of them will still exist a thousand years from now, I would say it's pretty close to zero, right? If you're a betting person, you're not going to bet that one of our thousands of one of your thousands of footprints is going to be still exist a thousand years from now. But there are seven billion people on Earth, and each one's producing hundreds of thousands of footprints. What are the chances that some footprints of any of them will survive a thousand years. Well, there, I'm going to put some money on that. I'm going to say it's not necessarily a hundred percent chance that one of them will survive, but I can say it's a very high probability that some footprint will still exist from one of those footprints that was made of those 7 billion people over the last year. Now let's get to the issue. Let's get to the problem. I think young earth creationists have a footprint problem. What do I mean by that? There are billions of footprints in the geological column. That's a fact. But according to young earth creationists, the majority of the geological column was formed when? Over just a few months, just 4,350 years ago. Hence, every single footprint that is in the geological column has to have formed nearly simultaneously during a global chaotic vent in which thousands of feet of sediment were deposited in a short period of time. Footprints in the geological record are I think a devastating fact that speaks against this alternative geological model of Earth's history. Now, despite this challenge, despite what seems to be the enormity of the problem for young Earth creationists, young Earth creationists have not only been willing to say this isn't a problem for their model, but they have tried to turn the tables and tried to claim that conventional geologists, they're the ones that have a problem. How do they do that? Well, I was at an Answers in Genesis conference once, and there the speaker just outright mocked the idea that dinosaur footprints could be preserved by any process that could occur today. He pointed out that it would be silly to think that footprints on a beach or even a muddy lake edge would last long enough to actually harden into rock or be preserved. And of course, the audience was like, oh yeah, like that's ridiculous. If I walk on a beach, I can't expect them to be, become footprints someday. I understand that what he was doing was just a gross overgeneralization, and he was using it as a rhetorical tool to point his audience to what he thought is a better solution, all right, to this falsely created what, footprint problem. But even top geologists like Dr. Andrew Snelling, all right, a PhD in geology, he's made similar statements in print. He addresses dinosaur footprints in this way. So here's a quote from Dr. Snelling. Biblical geologists, on the other hand, say it is conventional geologists who, in fact, face a dilemma. If geological change takes place slowly, surely footprints made in mud would be obliterated by wind and rain long before the prints were covered by new sediments and hardened into rock. Right? He's, he's taking the, the common perception, I think, of the average person in his audience that and young earth creationists have created in their audience that all processes occur at some very slow rate. So if you left a footprint there, it might take hundreds and hundreds of years for that footprint to get covered up with sediments and therefore preserved. So if it's going to take hundreds of years to get covered up, that footprint is going to erode before it gets covered and therefore it will never get preserved. And here you have a professor. Here you have a PhD in geology who's telling his audience that, yes, you can't expect dinosaur footprints to get preserved because if a dinosaur walks by and it takes hundreds of years for their footprints to get covered up, well, then they'll be gone by the time, by the time it exists. So therefore, this conventional way of understanding the fossilization of footprints doesn't work. But of course, that's not what conventional geologists believe. Here, further quote from Dr. Snelling. 
How can today's slow and gradual geological processes that occur over millions of years explain the preservation of delicate impressions in mud before they're washed away? Does the flood provide a better explanation? Now, Dr. Snelling's answer to the last question is, of course, yes, yes, of course, the flood provides a much better explanation because it's something that happens quickly and only quick things could preserve these very delicate fossils or delicate footprints. Right, but he's intentionally created a false dichotomy for his audience. In addition to painting a very false picture of what geologists, geologists actually believe about the principles of uniformitarianism, he portrays the conventional geological understanding as untenable to explain the occurrence of footprints, and thus he can provide an explanation for the footprints that sound so much better to his audience. Now, as shocking as this might seem, or maybe not shocking to some of you, Dr. Snelling just doesn't appear to be familiar with statistics or the many ways that fossil footprints can form. Later on, in a future video, I'm going to examine the statistical likelihood of dinosaur footprints being preserved over millions of years versus all at one time in a global flood. But just notice for right now that Dr. Snelling denies observational evidence. We have right before us, right here in the present, that we can see. I've shown you one already. I've shown you a footprint in Death Valley that is preserved, not necessarily for millions of years or thousands of years, but it still exists long after that person uh, stepped in that spot. Footprints are being preserved today in many different environments and with many mechanisms for their preservation that are known. And most reasonable people will accept. I'm going to point you also in a future episode to a case of dozens of human footprints that we know are at least 1,200 years old. And there's multiple other examples of human footprints that are preserved for us for thousands of years that are undeniable by answers in Genesis. So just from that, we know that footprints can be preserved. Young Earth creationists claim, and I guess presumably believe, that special circumstances are required to explain footprints. But since they believe that all or nearly all of them were produced in the span of one year during the global flood, the huge number of prints contained in the rocks would require a larger percentage of all the footprints made by animals running around trying to escape the flood. They would all basically have to be preserved. Now that is an extraordinary unlikely scenario. Let me state that in another way. There are billions of footprints in the fossil record. I'm going to show in a future episode that billions preserved are simply 0.0000001% of all the fossil footprints that have ever been, uh, I'm sorry, all the footprints that have ever been made, right? Lots of footprints have been made. Animals have stepped in mud and left a footprint, but how many have been preserved? An extraordinarily tiny fraction of those. But if you start out with quadrillions and quadrillions of fossil footprints, even if you only preserve a small number of them, you're still going to have millions and billions of footprints preserved. But Answers in Genesis doesn't have quadrillions of footprints to, to, to as a starting point and hope that some of them get preserved. They have billions of footprints they have to explain, but they only have a one-shot time in which organisms are making those footprints in the space of a very short period of time. Therefore, not nearly as many fossil footprints, I'm sorry, not nearly as many footprints are present for them to get preserved. So therefore, they have to propose that an extraordinarily large number or high percentage of the footprints that were made got preserved for us today. So we don't actually have a paradox, as my title asks. Footprints can be common even if they are very, very rarely formed. From an ancient Earth perspective, only a few footprints in the multitude of individuals during the lifetime of a population of millions of individuals need to be preserved, maybe even every thousand years or more, to account for the observed footprints in the fossil record. As I just said, even if only 0.0001% of all footprints left by dinosaurs, mammals, and humans were preserved in the geological record, the geological record would still be filled with footprints. And guess what? It is. So I've written on my blog many times about preserved footprints, and we're going to discuss some of those in, this, in these next episodes. 
the fact that fossilization of footprints can happen without a global catastrophe, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at a lot of other examples where it clearly is not a global catastrophe. It's not a global flood that resulted in the preservation of those footprints. So the fact that we know that the mechanism exists for preserving footprints is obvious once you become familiar with the fossil record and some of the examples I'm going to provide. After all, there are human footprints found in numerous places in the world, as we're going to see, and all young earth creationists recognize that these have formed after the global flood. Hence, they have to be aware that footprints can be observed in local context rather than during a unique global flood. So in some future episodes, we'll take a look at some specific sets of either fossilized footprints or recent footprints and talk about the mechanisms for their preservation. We'll also talk about uh, fossilized eggs and some other ichnofossils. Um, and maybe even something like this, all right? These are mud cracks. I took this picture also at Death Valley. Here I am standing on a washout from some recent flood and the mud has all dried and cracked. Now what's gonna happen probably is there's gonna be another flash flood six months from now, a year from now, and it's gonna bring a whole new swath of mud down into this valley and lay it out across on top of this mud right here. And that mud will then sink into these cracks and it will then harden. And then there'll probably be another layer of mud cracks on top of that. And so we see this all the time as well in the geological column. We see layers upon layers of cracked material uh, in which we see infills of the cracks with sediment that's placed on top of it. And the simplest explanation is that it's a series of events that occur over periods of time, right? With drying and wetting stages. All right, rather than leaving it right here, let me just take you to one really specific example of fossil footprints and the challenge they present for global flood geology. All right, why I say this is a global flood failure Right. I'm going to have other examples, but this is kind of a fun one because I've been talking a lot about elephants lately. And so let's look at fossilized footprints of elephants. So here I'm taking you to a location in, um, in the United Arab Emirates, a uh, paper by Fasal Bibi et al. in Biology Letters from 2012. And you're looking at a drone image, looking down on the landscape in the desert area of United Arab Emirates. This is all rock that you're looking at. This is scoured rock, right, at the surface. And if you can't see it, let me highlight here. Between these two red lines that I'm drawing here, there's a whole bunch of little dots running from south to north. And those dots represent trails. Those trails are footprints made by elephants, right? Now, how do we know they're elephants? I mean, nobody saw those elephants walk across this particular, what was apparently a mud flat at one time. Uh, but when I show you the shape of them, right, you'll be, I think you'll be convinced that these are probably elephants that were the cause of these uh, footprints, of these, what we'll call these markings, right, in the rock. But there's something else on this, and that is there's another trail right here, running through here, and it goes across on top of the footprints running from south to north, and then it runs right here all the way across here. Just in this scene, there are several thousand footprints. The ones running from south to north is a group of what looks to be about 13 elephants. Those 13 elephants are thought to have traveled together the reason we think they travel together is because the footprints are not all on top of one another. They do fall, they do, some of them cross over other ones, but of course a pack would not all be like right shoulder to shoulder. There's going to be some behind the others. Uh, but more importantly, they all have the same appearance. So if you had four traveling and then five traveling two or three days later, well, the mud would be have a different texture at a different time, right? It would be drying out or be getting wetter or, right? It would change. And therefore, the type of impression that the, the foot would make in that mud would be different on different days. And so all of them are have the same characteristics. That suggests it's a group all walking together. And so that's one of the things that's interesting about the paper is they're talking about like we can learn something about the behavior of these particular elephants. They traveled in groups. The groups also contain what appear to be uh, several male, uh, I'm sorry, several adults, 
probably females, but that's a little hard to say. Uh, traveling along with younger adults, right? Younger adults and, and youth, right? And that's typical of what elephants are today doing. And then what about this other single trail? Likely an adult male. For one thing, the actual footprints are fairly far apart and they can tell from the distance they are apart and the fact that it's not running, because there's ways you can tell from looking at the footprints whether how the person, how the individual is moving. Uh, they can estimate the size, and it appears this was a larger individual that's walking this way. Because you can think of it as probably like a lone male, and that lone male walked past later, as I said before, it walked over the other 13 trails. All right, so its footprints are all on top of the footprints running from south to north. So what we get is, we, this is a snapshot. It's a snapshot in time where all this rock is the same age. It represents a flat, very flat area at some point in, in past history, probably a mud flat of like a, a, a wide, large lake, right? And these elephants traveled through there, left their impressions in the mud. That mud likely dried. And then after it dried, maybe the lake levels rose again, uh, in, in sediment was filling was in those uh, new lake waters and that sediment then falls out of those lake waters covering this whole area with another layer of sediment that becomes another layer of rock um, and this whole layer this whole area was covered with more sediments and more rock in the past uh, this little uh, area here is at higher elevation so these are layers of rock that are above this general rock they are seeing here. And, and you can tell that because you see these footprints, they disappear and then they reappear over here. So presumably you came in here and you broke up this, these layers of rock, which um, are anywhere from just a few feet thick to, I think it goes up to like 10 or 15 feet thick. It's hard to tell from this picture. I'm gonna show another one in a moment. All right, presumably, I, I don't think, I don't think it takes us any stretch of the imagination to understand that these footprints probably go underneath the rock on that same layer and then come out here. And if we move that, remove that layer of rock, we'd see them. All right, so this represents some point in time. Now the question is when? When was this? Well, these, this rock layer is considered to be, in conventional dating, 20 million years old. So these are very old elephants, considered to be an extinct species. There is evidence in this particular area, around this area, of bones and tusks that suggest that these were elephants that had four tusks and they were straight. Uh, and there's a name for that particular extinct species of elephant. And so probably that is the elephant that made these particular uh, footprints. Now, let's look at it in a different way. We're looking from above. Let's look at it from ground level. And now you see there's a, here is an image of a close-up of one of these footprints, um, elephant footprints. And then here's a series of footprints coming along here. And so from there, you can judge the gait of the, of the elephant and get some idea of the size of that elephant from the distance of its uh, footprints apart from each other. But what I want to focus on here is, this is rock. I know it doesn't, maybe doesn't look at it, but this is rock. And then what we have over here where this dotted line is, there's a layer, a thin layer of rock above it, right, that sits on top of this. And this has been, you know, eroded in this whole area. But over here it hasn't eroded yet. So this stuff right here, when it erodes in the future, or if somebody comes along with a jackhammer and breaks off that little rock on top and then peels it away to the layer below, there may be more footprints there of other things. By the way, it's not just elephant footprints in this particular area. There's other things too, but the elephants are the most obvious. And then over here we have, it's even higher ground, right? So there's another layer of rock on top. And then here it's more obvious. There's a layer of rock here. There's a completely distinct layer of rock here. It's quite thick here. This is about a foot and a half to two feet thick, I believe. And then here's another layer of rock. And you think, well, well, that's just one just rock sitting out there. But no, what this is telling you is just, just from this image alone, and well, maybe this is another clue over here. And here's another clue back here. This whole area once was covered with rock at least this high, right? A good five to 10 feet of rock that high. Now, what I can't show you in this picture is that not too far off this way, there's a big mound of rock, layered sediments, and it's at least 100 feet high. 
And there's other points. Well, this one off and this, I should, where's my, here it is. This one over here, it's way far away. That's a good 100 feet higher, right, than the surface area that we're looking at here. And those points are all around, suggesting this entire area was covered with 100 feet of rock, at least. And who knows how much above that that's eroded. So when these elephants walked past on this particular flat plain, they left their footprints. Then sediments were deposited, probably in this large lake area, deposited from mountains farther away, and this whole area began to get covered with rock, uh, covered with sediments, which eventually turned into rock. But then, later, conditions changed. Maybe this area was uplifted somewhat by tectonic forces. And then what you have is you have erosion occurring. Right? And erosion has been occurring for a long time now. And as the land erodes, it re eventually eroded down to the point where we have this particular layer exposed in a few places. And we see those footprints appear. So the footprints were preserved, covered. Eventually, that whole all those sections of sediment turned into rock. And then the rock is stripped away by erosion, revealing these elephant footprints. Now, what, yeah, obviously you see the challenges here, some of the challenges for young earth creationism. All right, so we have to ask ourselves, when did these elephants walk here in the young earth time frame? And here's where it gets serious, right? This is why flood geology is a failure. This is what I would think should keep young earth creationists up at night going like, ah, oh, how are we going to explain this? When did these elephants exist? All right, these rocks, 20 million years old, are considered very youthful rocks in the entire geological column. And if you go to Answers in Genesis and you think about their model of flood geology, they actually believe that this rock and rocks like them in other places in the world are post-flood rocks. These are sediments that were laid down after the flood, turned into rock, and preserved things. So these are actually fossilized footprints from the post-flood world not actually preserved in a geologic in, in the in the flood itself remember andrew snelling trying to tell us that uh well, how could how could dinosaur footprints get preserved you could only that could only happen in a global flood he himself doesn't believe this is a flood rock and so therefore the fossilized footprints that are here are not preserved in a global flood so how are they preserved kind of the way i described right some kind of basin with a shallow lake with a maybe a large lake shore mud animals walk across eventually sediments get piled on top i think answers in genesis is going to answer the same way which means they believe that fossil footprints can be formed in what we would consider uh just the conventional way that most geologists understand that they happen it doesn't require a, geolo a, a global flood, like speakers say in their conferences. Um, boggles my mind that uh, they can be so radically inconsistent here. Okay, now, this, this seems impossible, right? How did these elephants get off the ark? Right, the elephants get, according to Ken Ham, there was like just a couple, two elephants on the ark. Those two elephants got the ark and then they divided into, they, they reproduced, they became populations, which then diverged into many different species of elephants, like a hundred different kinds of elephants. One is this extinct kind of elephant. This particular type of elephant was walking in United Arab Emirates, not far from maybe where they got off the ark, right? But they had to have walked here at some point after the flood which is only 4,350 years ago. Then they had to get, so they had to walk here. Then they had to have their sediments laid on top of this. This lake had to continue to fill with other sediments up to maybe 100 feet high or more. Then all of that had to turn to rock. It all had to turn to rock after the flood, not as a result of flood deposits after flood. Had to turn to rock. And then somehow, sometime in the last couple thousand years, this has all eroded. Hundreds of feet of rock have eroded and expose these elephant footprints? Crazy. It's just, I, I, don't know, I don't know how to describe it. To think you could compress all of these events into this one thing. That's why looking at specific examples like this is so powerful, right? 
you know, the creationists at conferences wave their hands and talk very generically about, oh, you know, dinosaur footprints are the result of animals scurrying across uh, mud flats that were just present for a few minutes, and then they all got preserved. Now, let's look at a real, a real place in time and ask how would you explain it from a young Earth creationist perspective. This is relatively easy to describe if you're an old age, old age creationist, right? If the Earth has been around for a long time, this is simply an event that occurred millions of years ago, and there's been plenty of time for all the different kinds of, of things to happen, right, in order to create the scenario, the scene that we see today. Now, ICR believes that the flood boundary is later, and so they would actually say that maybe these deposits are from the flood. And if they were from the flood, during the flood, that means very late because there's 10,000 feet of sediments below these fossil footprints. So the flood laid down 10,000 feet or more layers of, of sediments. And then all of a sudden, there was a point during the flood, during a global flood, in which there's these massive elephants walking around, which they couldn't have been walking around during the totality of the flood because the whole world was supposed to be covered with water, right? So I guess they were floating on vegetation mats or something like that, huge elephants. And then for a few moments, there was this mud flat that sort of existed. They jumped off, they walked across here, and then moments later, this mud flat got covered with more water during this global flood and layered more sediments on top of them. And that's what preserved these footprints, right? So maybe ICR could do that because they believe these are flood sediments. I don't care which way you go, they're both uh, fantastical explanations, which uh, bear no, uh, uh, no sense of reality, all right? Anyway, I think these are really fascinating uh, examples, and I'm going to provide you with several additional ones in future videos, in which we go to specific places and look at specific trackways, and we ask ourselves, how would we explain the series of events that got us to this point of preserving these particular footprints at this particular moment in time? Um, and these elephants are a great place to start, right? They probably, most likely, must have existed after the flood. How did they get there? How did all this get covered up? How did it turn into rock? How did it get eroded? And let's throw in one additional thing. This part of the United Arab Emirates in this particular region there is very, very old archaeological remains of ancient humans that is found essentially on top of these eroded layers. So we're saying, like, how would you get hundreds of feet of rock and then erode it all? But it all has to be eroded before we have this evidence of humans in the area. And that evidence of human occupation is thousands of years old itself. There just isn't any time to preserve these uh, elephant footprints in the young earth model. So the flood geology is a failure with respect to answering questions like where did these footprints come from? All right, let's quit there for today. We'll be back, as I said, with a bunch of other examples of fossilized footprints. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.